Good morning to each one of you. We're glad to see that everyone is surviving the drought. It's feast, feast or famine, isn't it? Got a few more coming in here. Would you bow with me as we begin our class? Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging you as our God and our Creator. Father, we're, we ask that you be with us as we continue the study of Ezekiel. We know that there are many things in there that we don't fully understand. We ask your guidance as we think about those things and, and study them and, and try to put them into a proper perspective. Be with us in that study, and it's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. We are in the very last part of Ezekiel. We've got a few verses in chapter 46 that I'm going to basically read because don't don't have anything to add to them and then go into 47. This is the conclusion of the book. We have been through all of the trials in the early part of the book where the people are going into exile and Ezekiel is in place in Babylon to encourage them, to warn them that further disasters are going to come upon the people, that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, the temple is going to be destroyed, and they're going to have a period of time that they have to live in exile, but that there will be an end to the, those times and the people will be allowed to come back. And the last, from beginning in chapter 40 of Ezekiel, it is God showing him what the future is going to be like. There's going to be a lot of changes in their life, but that he is going to continue to be their protector, their savior, their provider. And that is a major part of Ezekiel that we really don't understand, the, the construction or the, the vision of a new building, a new temple, a new manner of worship. Uh, we don't understand very much about that. And the conclusion of that part of Ezekiel begins in chapter 19, or verse 19 of chapter 46. And it's going to be preparing the offerings Okay, beginning in verse 19. Now he brought me through the entrance, which was at the side of the gate into the holy chambers of the priest, which faced toward the north. And there was a place situated at their extreme western end. And he said to me, this is the place where the priest shall boil the trespass offering, the sin offering, and where they shall bake the grain offering so that they do not bring them out into the outer court to sanctify the people. So the purpose of this is to isolate the preparation of these sacrifices from the people. Then he brought me out into the outer court and caused me to pass by the four corners of the court. And in fact, in every corner of the court, there was another court. In the four corners of the court were enclosed courts, 40 cubits long and 30 wide. All four corners were the same size. There was a row of building stones all around in them, all around the four of them, and cooking horse were made under the rows of the stones all around. And he said to me, These are the kitchens where the ministers of the temple shall boil the sacrifices of the people. You know, that, again, the symbolism of all of this escapes me. Uh, if you're familiar with the character Forrest Gump in the movie, one of his favorite sayings was, well, I see some smiles. That's all I have to say about that. That's all I have to say about that. Kind of summarizes my feelings about this. I don't know. 
Don't understand it. Chapter 47 is a little different. Chapter 47 is going to get into some symbolisms that we can go throughout both the Old and the New Testament and really come out with a pretty good understanding of what is going on. What is the meaning? The first one that we're going to talk about is water. Chapter 47, verse 1. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east, and the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. The significance here is that this water is coming out of the same gate that God's glory entered. When the glory left the temple back in the early, the early part of Ezekiel, it left, he left toward the east, and he comes back from the east, and this water is flowing toward the east. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east, and there was water running out on the right side. Water is coming out of the temple. Verse 3, And when the man went out to the east, with his line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters that came up to my ankles. So he left the gate, when a thousand cubits, which if you use a small cubit is 1,500, if you use the cubit that was used earlier, a cubit and a hand breadth, probably 1,750 feet thereabouts, but somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 feet from the temple, the water was up to his ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees, the same distance the depth of that water went from his ankle to his knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Same distance, and it went from his knees to his waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which must one swim, a water, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? The best thought that uh, I came across on that, Son of man, have you seen this? That was the, the reading in every version that I looked at. But keep this in mind is the most likely thought. Keep this in mind. Keep in mind what you have seen and he's been told to relate all of this to the people. Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. Now, what is the symbolism here? What is the, the thought? We can probably never ever appreciate the value of water to those people. You know, we, we grow up and, and most of us have had access to fresh water fairly easily throughout most of our lives. And just growing short of water, you know, we may have our wells may have gone dry. Now, can you hear me? All right. 
my reputation is that all I have to do is get close to any technology and it falls apart. Okay, we were just talking about the importance of water to those people. That is a desert. What we would consider almost all of it, except near a spring or near the few rivers that exist, the primary one being the Jordan River. Let's look at some other symbolism about these waters that I have found interesting. The first one is in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah is one of those prophets that worked and the most common date that's given for his writings in, is around the year 520. Do you want this mic? Yes. Time out. <laughs> okay. We're talking about Zechariah and uh, when he was writing. Uh, most common date is around the year 520. That would have been about oh, 15 to 20 years after the Jews had been allowed to, to leave their captivity after Cyrus's decree, giving them the freedom to return to, to Israel. It was a period of time when uh, they had the first group had gone, but they had grown discouraged. They were not continuing to work on the temple. They weren't working on the, the uh, uh, gates, the fences. He was one, along with Haggai, that was writing or sent to encourage the people to continue, to give them uh, a little bit of backbone to continue their work and, and do what they needed to do to restore Jerusalem and the temple back to its former glory. His book also is, uh, is noted for a lot of messianic prophet prophecies. He, he goes more into long-term benefits as opposed to just literally the short-term uh, physical benefits that the people are going to enjoy. And in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 8, And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem. You know, the same image that Ezekiel is using here. Half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. In, in Zechariah's writings, the water is flowing both directions, all-inclusive. In Ezekiel's writings, it's only flowing one direction, flowing to the east. So, and continuing in verse 8, In both summer and winter it shall occur, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be, the Lord is one, and his name one. I think we can see here that Zechariah is using the same image of water flowing from Jerusalem to indicate the blessings that are going to occur in the entire world, a messianic prophecy, but still using the same image. Now let's go to Revelation. Chapter 22. Verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as a crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits. Each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Using the same image to portray a future glory of all of the world, but using the image of the flowing water. 
think we can see that there is a consistent image of water. We can go to John 4, 413. Water springs up to eternal life. 737, rivers of living water. Psalms 46, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Isaiah 33, Jerusalem, a place of broad rivers and streams. We can certainly see a theme throughout the Bible of God's blessings are symbols of water, flowing water gives life. It provides the basic necessities of physical life and symbolically the blessings of spiritual life. Okay. Any, any thoughts or questions or so far? Okay. We've got a couple over here. The other thing I noticed there is that he, it's flat. He's, you know, he walks a thousand feet or whatever oh. it is, and it's only his ankles, and then he goes another thousand feet. And I think Zechariah, immediately after the verses you just read, it's, it makes reference to that too. It says that it's going to be a flat plain right. all the way yeah. to, and uh, there might be some relation there to, you know, John the Baptist was told he was come to prepare the way and that the mountains would be smooth and the valleys would be filled and so spiritually there's going to be a smooth plane ahead for everyone yeah it's going to be a level playing ground for every person good point okay I think Paul had his hand up too I just finished say Jim is this this here water that he's talking about uh, is it a, uh, Jesus word is it any word you know, uh, I, that you never. Th I mean, you know, when he's talking about in John, is that? I think that certainly could be. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I just, yeah. If you, you know. it it certainly could be. Certainly could be. It's just a it's a consistent theme about blessings, and specifically, as Paul says, uh, Jesus's words. Anything else? Okay. Somebody over here? Oh, Elsie. And, and, and a few verses that you read, it was always flowing water, moving water. It's not stagnant water, which means it's alive. Living water can save. I think it's pointing to Christ. You know, it's pointing really to baptism into Christ later on. Water has saving qualities. We can't live without water physically, and we can't live without water spiritually because we have to be buried in water to live in Christ, to be raised up in, into Christ Jesus. Yeah. Good point. Jeremiah actually makes that point that Elsie just made. He compares it to stagnant water as in a cistern. And this is not stagnant water. This is water that's alive, that's moving, that's fresh, that's good. And the comparison to, to baptism, certainly valid. Just one of the most important images that I think that we've seen in Ezekiel that we can bring forward to, to us. Okay? Verse 7. When I returned there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. This brings into mind certainly the tree of life 
Uh, we saw that in the reading of uh, Revelation. Uh, then he said to me, the water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. What sea would we be talking about here? Flows out of Jerusalem, goes to the east, enters the valley, goes into the sea. It would have to be the Dead Sea. Its waters are healed. I've always been fascinated about the Dead Sea. It's the lowest place on earth. The water, the top of the water, the surface water, is 1,400 feet below sea level. It's almost 1,000 feet deep. Its salinity on average is well above 300,000 parts per million. Over 30% dissolve solids. It has been a major source of revenue, of income, and many of the people in that area in Jesus' time made their living from the Dead Sea, from all of the things that, that it can provide. Not edible, not living, but things that come from its waters, salts, asphalt. It is going to be healed. Its waters are going to be healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the white rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because the waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. There is nothing except a small brine shrimp that exists in the Dead Sea. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to En Eglium, and they will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be that of the same kinds of the fi as the fish of the great sea, the Mediterranean, exceedingly many. Going to be enough water coming out from the temple to flush the Dead Sea. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed swamps and marshes will not be healed. Why? They will be given over to salt. Salt is also necessary. Salt was something, one of the provisions that comes from the Dead Sea, sodium chloride. It's necessary for life too. And it's still going to be provided. Along the banks of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. Major change, because there's not anything like that there now. They will bear fruit every month, because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for medicine. Again, the image of the, the tree of life. As in everything that we have seen since we've gotten into, or since we've started this part of Ezekiel, the question is, is this literal or is it symbolic? I fall out for what it's worth that it's symbolic. We certainly understand the symbolism that God provides everything we need. 
And that's what this is saying, that God is going to provide their needs. Could it have happened? Certainly. It probably has been in its time past a freshwater lake. So could it have been changed at, at this period of time? Absolutely. But if we focus on the literal here, I think it takes somewhat away from the symbolism, from the figurative, that God provides what we need. Okay, any? Okay. I was looking at verse uh, 12, where it says, by the river on the bank, on one side or the other, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. And it reminded me of Psalms 1, where the psalmist there says, he's delighting in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither does not and wither. whatever he does prospers, right? And so there's some symbolism there to I think what he's saying here. And it could go back to what Brother Pedford was saying about the, the waters possibly being the word of the Lord, the law of the Lord, what have you that brings life uh, to all. Yeah, and we see that symbolism again uh, in more general terms perhaps and what we read in Revelation. But the overriding lesson here is that God is the provider. All of these rivers that we talked about emanating from Jerusalem, the center, the temple, God's presence was in that temple. And it was coming out the same gate that he went in and out. We should, we should take the same lessons that they should take from that. God is a creator and the provider. Okay, anything else? I think that's a, this is one of the most potent lessons, partly be, maybe because we can see more of it, we can understand it more, but Certainly a potent lesson for us today. Okay, verse 13. Thus says the Lord God, these are the borders by which you shall divide the land as an inheritance among the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions, consistent with what we have seen in the earlier law, in the earlier division. You shall inherit it equally with one another, for I have raised my hand in an oath to give it to your fathers, and this land shall fall to you as your inheritance. Let's think about, before we read this, is this literal or is this figurative? And if so, what does it mean? This land is going to be divided and given to the tribes. Are the tribes available to inherit and to go live in this land that has been given them? They were, the, the northern tribes, the northern ten tribes had been conquered by the Assyrians 200 years before all of this occurred. The Assyrians, in contrast to, to later invaders, did not necessarily deport people as much as they brought their people in to live together. And that resulted in mixed marriages. In fact, one of the terms 
that's generally used for the ten tribes is the Samaritans. The northern ten tribes can be referred to as either Samaritans or Israel. Samaritans were simply, uh, I guess, crossbred Assyrian transplants versus the Israelites. Were they available as individual tribes to come back and inherit this land after they're released from captivity? Plus, do you remember what happened to the tribe of Simeon? Genesis 45, when Jacob is talking to his sons, he tells Simeon that his group shall be spread among the other tribes because of Simeon's role in avenging his sister's rape. Joshua 19, we're also told that they are disseminated among the, the tribe of Judah. All that being said is, again, I kind of believe that this is a symbolic reunification. That this is when God is, is opening it up to all of the Israelites. Could it be that remnants of these tribes come in? Absolutely. But again, the... Okay, Ralph. In the time of Nehemiah, when <clears throat> in the time of Nehemiah, when they were trying, when the uh, Northern Kingdom was trying to interfere with the rebuilding of Jerusalem, uh, they were rejected by Nehemiah, and he refused to have anything to do with them, and wouldn't allow them to to participate in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Yes. There was a whole group, that, in, not only the remnants of those people, but the Ammonites were also included in that. That uh, certainly there were some some of those people, but again, the symbolism of reunification and this available for all, I think, is the major thing that we should be uh, looking at. Verse 15, this shall be the border of the land on the north from the great sea by the road to Hethlon as one goes to Zedad. I'm not going to read all of these names because I can't pronounce them. They're mostly archaic names. Uh, the Essentially, the northern border was up in the area that we now know as Lebanon. I'm not sure just exactly how far into Lebanon it goes, maybe as far as Beirut. But is, it is an east-west line that starts in southern Lebanon. The western border is going to be the Mediterranean Sea. The eastern border is going to be the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, and the Dead Sea. And that's going to continue south into the southern, southern border, and then it's going to curve around and go down into Egypt, not quite as far as the Nile River. It's going to be a total distance of about 170 miles north to south. And the northern border is probably 30 or 40 miles wide. The southern border up to 70 miles wide. So it's a large area. And it's going to be divided east-west without any 
thought given to geographic boundaries. It'll be just simply an east-west line. Uh, see, how far did I get in summary? Let me just, uh, starting at the north is Dan, then Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, Judah, and that gets them down to the temple complex that we've talked about, which the northern part of that would be the Levites, and then the temple, and then the city property. Then Benjamin, Simeon, Ishkar, Zebulun, and Gad. It's significant that this division is totally different than the one that's given earlier in Numbers. In this division, the concubine tribes, the tribes that are derived from Jacob's concubines, are at the extremities. The, the closest to the temple are going to be Judah and Benjamin from north to south, Jacob's favorites. From there on, it's going to be uh, well, from Judah, the next one is Reuben, the oldest. And Reuben was one that was really pretty active in when uh, Jacob was being forced to go to, to uh, Egypt. Reuben was one that, that really negotiated things between uh, the family and his father. And then Ephraim and Manasseh. And coming to the south, Benjamin is the closest to the temple. And then Simeon and Ishkar, the tribes, the uh, concubine tribes. So the division is a little bit uh, interesting. I don't know what to make of it other than it starts with uh, Jacob's favorites. Let's pick up the reading then in, in uh, 21. Thus you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. It shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you and bear children among you. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. I'm sorry, I have, well, it shall be that whatever tribe the stranger dwells, you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. Then we go into, uh, we're going to run out of time. We're going to go into the names of the tribes and the divisions. Let's see. Let's skip down to 13 of 48. Opposite the border of the priest, the, Le the Levite shall have an area 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in width. Its entire length shall be 25,000 and its width 10,000. And they shall not sell or exchange any of it. They may not alienate this best part of the land for it is holy to the Lord. The Levites, like the priest, or like the prince that we talked about last week, are not to sell or give up any of their land, for it is the best part and it is holy. Verse 15, the 5,000 cubits in width that remain along the edge of the 25,000 shall be for general use by the city for dwellings and common land, and the city shall be in the center. And then it gives the measurements. These are common lands that are going to be used for the benefit of all. Then there's a whole series of verses here that give some dimensions of this holy land. And then 
Look at verse 19. The workers of the city from all the tribes of Israel shall cultivate it. The entire district shall be 25,000 cubits by 25,000 cubits. You shall set apart the holy district with the property of the city. And then we go into, again, the part that belongs to the prince that we talked about last week. This is going to be the land that is on the east and the west side of the temple, extending all the way from the temple complex to the Mediterranean Sea and to the Jordan River. The rest shall belong to the prince on one side and on the other of the holy district of the city's property next to the 25,000 cubits of the holy district as far as the eastern border. Uh, I'm not going to read the rest of that. I'm going to skip down. Uh, well, in, in verse 23, it, it divides the, uh, the land again. And it, let's go to 30. I'm sorry, I'm skipping around. I'm going to finish this before the bell rings. The gates of the city in its name, verse 30. These are the exits of the city, the exits of the city. On the north side, measuring 4,500 cubits, the gates of the city shall be named after the tribes of Israel. And the three gates northward, one gate for Reuben, one gate for Judah, one gate for Levi. On the east side, 4,500 cubits, three gates, one gate for Joseph, one gate for Benjamin, one gate for Dan. South side, one gate for Simeon, one gate for Ishkar. West side, one gate for Gad, one gate for Asher, and one gate for Naphtali. All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of that city on that day shall be the Lord is there. The Lord is there. We see variations of that name uh, several other places in the Bible uh, about referring to Jerusalem. The Lord is there. Okay. Any questions? I'd like to spend a few minutes on uh, just some general things about Ezekiel. Any? I know we ran through that last part quickly and erratically. Okay, what are some lessons, just general lessons that we can take from the book of Ezekiel? I made a list of things that refer to the character of God that, that really show up, and this list could probably be innumerable. But one of the first things that I thought about in just thinking of the character of God is God is jealous. Because that was one of the major things that the Israelites were guilty of, is taking other gods, even if they would consider God as their creator, they would still adopt the gods of the lands that they were in, specifically Egyptian. God didn't like that. He was jealous. He was patient. Over and over again, the people would rebel. He would send them a prophet. Do you have something, Ralph, or was that a... You know, it's like a lot of, a lot of the books that, we, that are written at this particular period of time. It's, I believe, and you've mentioned it before, I believe the one thing the people should take away from this book was hope. That they weren't totally abandoned. They were punished, but there was light at the end of the tunnel. There would be a time when they would be, again, rejoined with God if they would. Yeah. That really is what the book was about. That, that is Ezekiel's... Uh, 
God's prophet oh. prophecy may be a long time coming, but God's prophet prophecy will be fulfilled. It will come true. Yeah. Good point. Okay, just go through these. God is just. He is firm. He's caring. He wants all to come to him. But when his mind is made up, I kind of regret using this, but I couldn't think of a better word. He's ruthless. You know, when he gets on a mission, he's going to accomplish that mission. He's in charge then and now. One of the things that really came home to me as I was studying and trying to prepare is the historical accuracy of this book. And all of the names that are mentioned, Cyrus, Darius, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, all of the kings that we started out with in the very first part of the book, Josiah, Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, Zechariah, they're all historical figures. Sometimes God uses, and I use the word bad actors, uh, should have used maybe godless people, those that don't know him, to accomplish his will. And I had uh, down what Elsie said, prophecy will be fulfilled. One of the things that struck me in, in trying to put this together, and Ezekiel means a lot more if you incorporate other books into it. Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, Haggai. Uh, but if you, if you put all, all that together, the people really did not want to leave captivity. Many of them didn't. Many of them stayed. They had it good. They didn't want to change. And that's one of the big lessons for us. We can get awfully comfortable in our position. They immediately fell away. If we go to Jeremiah in particular, and if we had time, I was going to go to the last chapter of Jeremiah and look at the things that Jeremiah was struggling against. The very things that God had told the people not to do, they're already doing. Uh, anything else? Ezekiel is a rich book. I hope the study has been profitable. I certainly have learned a lot. Uh, I've enjoyed all of the book, except chapters 40 through 48. Difficult. Well, I'm going to leave it there then. It's about time for the second bell. Thanks for your attention.